I am here with Dr. Richard Bett, Johns Hopkins University. Thank you so much, Dr. Bett, for joining me. So if you could just help me understand, um, before we learn about Sextus and Pyrrhicist, who was a skeptic, what exactly does being a skeptic mean in terms of his time? Right. Um, so, yeah, the, uh, in ancient Greco-Roman times, skepticism basically meant suspending judgment. So you don't have any definite views one way or the other about a whole range of questions. Um, and yeah, for Sextus, he's very clear. Uh, this, is, this applies to you know, judgments about how the world really is. So it doesn't mean that you stop making decisions in your daily life. Uh, you go along with the appearances and that's good enough uh, in terms of being able to decide what to do. But what you don't do is uh, engage in a lot of theories uh, about how things really are. And people who do, he thinks are going to be uh, troubled in various ways. Whereas he who suspends judgment um, by producing a whole lot of opposing ideas on the subject and pondering them and therefore finding that none of them, it sort of wins out over the others, um, he finds himself uh, achieving tranquility because of that. Um, yeah, ataraxia is the Greek word meaning literally sort of absence of trouble, absence of harassment. Um, so yeah, that's the state of mind that he, was aiming for in the first place, but finds that he gets by suspending judgment. And people who uh, are dogmatists in his language, uh, that is people who do have definite theories, definite um, beliefs, uh, they're not tranquil, they're troubled. So that's a thumbnail sketch of um, what he says skepticism is. Uh, so something about the process of, or the result of suspending judgment gets someone tranquility. But if I could ask more about this, of the action, about this action of suspending judgment rather than suspending a belief or suspending thought or suspending action, what exactly do you mean or does he mean by suspending judgment? Okay, um, well, I mean, suspending judgment is the English translation. Um, there's only one word. Uh, in Greek, uh, epoche, uh, it, it doesn't mean suspending action. Uh, and I mean, that came out in, in what I said before, you, you, you follow the appearances to make your decisions in everyday life. But yeah, as for the other things that you put up on that card, I mean, belief, judgment, thought, there really isn't that much difference as far as he's concerned. What it means is uh, not committing yourself to definite views about things. That's, that's the basic idea. Um, and so, yeah, someone who has intellectual commitments, someone who has moral commitments, who's, you know, really decided things are a certain way, um, that's the person who doesn't suspend judgment. And that's the person who uh, Sextus thinks will be troubled and that he wants, and that's the mindset that he wants to get away from. Why do we call people like Sextus Empiricists or the people who suspend judgment skeptics why okay. skeptics right okay well the greek word skeptikos which is where skeptic comes from simply means inquirer so a skeptic according to him is someone who looks at all the different ideas on either side of a question um and yeah usually when you do that you're trying to discover the truth um and he says the skeptic starts out as someone who is trying to discover the truth um but what they find is there are all these opposing views and there's no way to decide between them. Um, and so when you, you know, look at all the different ideas that there are on a certain subject, you'll find yourself unable to choose between them. And so you suspend judgment. But yeah, basically skeptic, skeptic uh, skepticos means inquirer. And so, yeah, he's an inquirer in the sense that he hasn't come down on one side or the other uh, on any uh, question, again, about how things really are. Um, and whereas the other people, uh, the other philosophers, you know, other theorists, um, they're the people who do have definite views. Uh, and so, you know, in a sense, they've stopped inquiring. Um, oh. And so, yeah, so Sextus is still 
um, I mean, to cite the title of my book, is still keeping an open mind. He, he hasn't come down on one side or the other. Um, and in that sense, he's an inquirer. So yeah, it's a little unexpected what inquirer turns out to mean, but that's that's basically it. And that's that's the origin of the word skeptic, which I mean, has meant a lot of different things over history, but that's what it meant when it first was coined. And yeah, it's just from a, a normal Greek word, meaning to inquire on, or to look at something, to look into things. Um, yeah. So when we're supposed to be keeping an open mind, on the other side, what that means is we are not supposed to be thinking we've got the answer. That's right. Is yeah. that the same thing as being closed minded or what exactly is the opposite of keeping an open mind? Um, the opposite of, well, the opposite of his recommended attitude uh, is, well, there's, there's two possible opposing views. <laughs> Uh, and this is what he says in the very first sentences of, of his best known book, Outlines of Pyrrhonism. Um, you might think you've discovered the truth. So in that case, as I said, you're not inquiring anymore. Or you might think the truth is just impossible to discover. And so from that point of view, you've given up inquiring as well. Um, and so both of those would be, as far as he's concerned, closed-minded attitudes. Mm -hmm. Um, and he's doing neither of those two things. He's still uh, keeping the you know, play of ideas open. Uh, and you know, as far as he's concerned, you know, maybe in the future, he actually will discover the truth. He, he hasn't ruled that out, um, but for everything he's tried so far, what he finds is um, the opposing ideas, the opposing impressions, the opposing arguments just balance each other out. Um, and so, uh, suspension of judgment is what he ends up with. And in fact, he doesn't just find this. Uh, I mean, he says skepticism is an ability to make that happen. Because um, once he's done this enough times and he finds suspension of judgment produces tranquility, it sort of turns into a program of its own. So now the goal, the actual goal is to maintain suspension of judgment by being really good at, you know, a, assembling opposing ideas on each side of a question. Um, and so it turns out to be a sort of recipe for or, or a mechanism for generating suspension of judgment. Um, so yeah, he, he calls it an ability. So yeah, it's not a theory, it's not a conclusion, it's an ability to do something that is um, bring about this situation where you've got equally powerful opposing ideas on a given question. So I'm curious if you think that this program is tenable in practice or, or is it just an ideal to keep an open mind forever, to continue inquiring forever, or, or is, it, is it a goal we might achieve? Um, okay, well, I think I, there, there are a number of limitations. I mean, if we're talking about, you know, is this, uh, applicable today, uh, I think there are a number of limitations there. Um, first of all, I mean, I'm not convinced tranquility is always going to be the result of suspension of judgment. Hmm. I mean, sometimes, maybe it will, could be sometimes, I mean, you know, supposing you really, supposing you're a star athlete and you really care about winning the next Olympic gold, um, and you know you might be desperately disappointed when you don't win. Whereas you know if you're not if you're someone like me who you know I, I have run a lot of five Ks in my local area and you know um, sometimes I'm in the top three in my age group and that's nice. But you know if not, who cares? So I mean that's an example where um, the idea of tranquility following suspension of judgment does seem to make sense. But you can think of lots of other examples where. Um, you know, having firm moral convictions, for example, will give you peace of mind. It won't, and, and being uncertain might uh, reduce your peace of mind. So I think his notion that tranquility is sort of a reliable outcome of suspension of judgment, uh, that seems to me not a terrifically plausible view. And in fact, well, that, that's, not, that's not just for today. I think I, even in his day, um, it's not clear that he's really got a knockdown argument about that. Okay, so that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is, um, I don't think suspension of judgment on all questions about how things really are is really an option for us anymore. Uh, oh. I mean, you know, 
we, we, we know quite a lot of stuff about the way the world works. Uh, I mean, you know, obviously science is an ongoing process, but uh, you know, the, the periodic table of elements is not going to be overturned, I don't think. That, and, and, you know, and, and, and well, the other thing is scientific discoveries have seeped into our lives. Uh, I mean, you know, the fact that we can talk to each other by Zoom that's the result of a whole lot of scientific discovery, which is not going to be overturned, I don't think. So yeah, I mean, of, of course, there's room for further discovery uh, and at the frontiers of the sciences. And there are a number of other fields where maybe things are still as much up in the air as they ever were, such as you know, ethical and political questions, maybe. Um, so I certainly don't want to say suspension of judgment is not um, an issue anymore, mm -hmm. but the idea of a kind of across the board universal suspension of judgment about how things are, um, that seems to me to be, it probably was, again, probably not an option in his day entirely. And so maybe you're right, maybe it was just an ideal, but certainly today, I, I just don't think that's um, realistic. Um, so what that leaves us with, I think, is precisely this idea of open mindedness. Um, which, because uh, I, I mean, he doesn't use the word open-mindedness. That's my title uh, for the book. Um, so yeah, I mean, if, so if, if you don't think that tranquility will always follow suspension of judgment, and if you don't think that universal suspension of judgment is an option today anyway, well, then what you're left with, I think, is a kind of recommendation to always be open to views on all sides of the question. Um, and you know, sometimes that will lead you to discover something. Um, and uh, so, I mean, it, it could point in a different direction from what Sextus is thinking, but other times, you know, it might lead you to suspension of judgment. Uh, but in any case, um, I mean, an open-minded person is someone who wants to uh, come to whatever views they do come to as a result of looking at all sides of the question. Um, and that, you know, that's the lesson that I think is still available for us today, which is somewhat different from what he himself is promoting. But uh, I think he, you know, he shows us an extreme example, perhaps, of um, always being willing to look at uh, other points of view. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that, that doesn't mean you, you'll never come to conclusions. Uh, it means if you do come to conclusions, it's because you've really looked into the question and you don't just um, you know, settle for some uh, idea without considering the alternatives, which I think there's an awful lot of these days. Um, I mean, to take a terrible example recently, I mean, uh, if people had actually looked into it, they would not have thought that the 2020 election was stolen and they wouldn't have um, stormed the Capitol on January 6th. Uh, I mean, I don't think the people who did that can be persuaded to change their minds, but there might be other people who, um, you know, agree, you know, agree that the election was stolen, who probably should have looked into it more carefully. And if they had, well, then they would find out that it wasn't stolen. Um, so, you know, that, that's, the, that's the kind of thing where I think open-mindedness could, and, and, you know, I don't mean this, I don't mean to suggest uh, uh, it's all on one side. I mean, all of us could benefit from thinking more carefully every so often about uh, the, uh, the views that we hold and whether we're justified in holding them. So that's, that brings up a really good example. And I want to think more about it. it. It turns out that someone who does do research will find evidence, really good evidence, in favor of the election being stolen. And you'll also find really good evidence that the election was not stolen. And this, this makes me wonder, is there something about um, keeping an open mind or continuing the inquiry, being a skeptic? Mm -hmm. How does that play with the fact that there's evidence both for and against the same thing. The fact that appearances mislead us and guide us correctly. Uh, can you help me understand how we can, how we can put these ideas together 
um, that we should pay attention to the appearances, but that the appearances misguide us. Uh, how should we understand all, all of these? Well, right, no, that's a good point. And, and so, I mean, you can imagine someone coming to suspension of judgment on the question if they really find the opposing appearances equally strong. Mm, equally um, strong, okay. Well, that, I mean, that, that's what it takes. I mean, it, it's, it's the equal strength in the opposing ideas. That's what he says will, because then, you know, there's just no kind of motivation to go one way rather than the other. Mm. Um, but I don't know, in this particular case, I would think um, if you keep on looking into it, you'll find that actually the evidence is more on one side than the other. Um, mm. and, but yeah, I mean, the, 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 there's no guarantee with this kind of program that you're always going to come out with a definite result. Sometimes you will come out with suspension of judgment. Um, and you know, that, that, that could be cases where that's um, a quite understandable reaction. Um, personally, I don't think that's the case on the question who won the 2020 election. But, uh, but, but yeah, you're quite right. There are, there are opposing views, and so you have to sift through them. So, uh, well, opposing impressions and opposing evidence, yeah. Yes, and, and since we have opposing, opposing cultures, opposing values, yeah. opposing things that we consider facts, That's opposing, right. yep. you know, uh, sources of information, yeah. that would help explain why there's so many views and why everyone thinks theirs is correct. That's right, and I think, you know, I mean, if we had a little more of this kind of willingness to consider alternatives, mm. then that might, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not naive about this. I, I don't want to be too optimistic, but I think it, the more of that there was, the more it might be possible to start breaking down those kind of ideological silos that mm. we live in. Um, so, you know, that's, I mean, I wrote this before um, the 2020 election, but similar kinds of issues has been around for a number of years obviously, and, and probably they always have been around, um, but social media sort of intensified the effect. Um, but yeah, so uh, it, it might just help to um, you know, allow us to understand one another a little better if we were more willing to look at opposing positions uh, and see what there is to be said for them and you know, maybe not much. Uh, or maybe there is, you know, that's, that's what you have to look into. So do you think that that was Sextus Empiris's goal was to, no, no, what I think, was I mean, this goal then? His goal was, I mean, I mean, this, so what I've been talking about the last few minutes is the sort of lesson of value that I think we can get out of it today, but that's somewhat different from what he himself was uh, aiming for. His goal was, well, as I said, his, his original goal was to achieve tranquility by discovering the truth, um, which is what a lot of other philosophers at the time thought they could do. Um, but he doesn't get tranquility that way. He gets tranquility by an unexpected other way, namely by suspending judgment. Um, and yeah, he uses this nice image to sort of illustrate the idea of getting the results by an unexpected route. Um, so <clears throat> there's a, a famous Greek painter called Apelles, and the story is told, he says, we don't know, any, we don't know anything else about it, but he says the story is told, uh, this painter was trying to achieve the effect of a horse's foam, you know, breathing, you know, breathing hard, the foam coming off the horse's mouth, and it was a really difficult effect, and he just couldn't do it. So he got mad, and he would use a sponge to wipe off his paints, and he flung the sponge at the canvas, and it just so happened that produced the effect of the foam that he was looking for in the first place. So that's sort of an analogy for Sextus's um, goal of achieving tranquility, which he originally thought he would achieve by discovering the truth. But instead, as I said, he finds there are all these opposing ideas and he can't choose between them. So he suspends judgment. Um, but it just so happened, uh, he says, that tranquility follows from that. Mm. Um, so then, as I said, it becomes a sort of self-sustaining program when he's, supposing that's happened enough times, he'd say, okay, so now I can see, it, it seems like whenever I suspend judgment, I get tranquility. So now I'm gonna turn this into 
rather than discovering, rather than trying to discover the truth, I'm going to um, try to bring about suspension of judgment and, and make that the immediate goal. And, and then I'll get tranquility. Um, so that's where the skeptical ability that I mentioned earlier uh, yeah. comes in. So that's his goal. Um, but yeah, as I said, for various reasons, I don't think that's a realistic thing for us to aspire to today. And I mean, as I said, I, I don't think it was super realistic even in his day, but there's a lot more chance of achieving suspension of judgment when you don't have any experimental techniques and where you know, debates about the nature of the world very quickly come down to just opposing arguments, opposing abstract arguments. Um, I mean, for example, there were ancient thinkers who thought the world was composed of atoms, okay? There were also ancient thinkers who thought uh, the world was composed of sort of completely, infinitely divisible stuff uh, that, you know, no matter how finely you divide it, you can still keep on dividing it. Um, so, you know, those are two opposing views about the ultimate structure of matter. Um, and they each had sophisticated arguments on their side. Um, and it's pretty hard to know, if you don't have any experimental techniques, it's pretty hard to know how you could decide between those. So I think suspension of judgment is much more of a likelihood uh, in the ancient context than it is now on many subjects. Uh, again, as I, as I say, it's not that suspension of judgment is never realistic today, but it's a, a, a complete across the board suspension of judgment that doesn't seem to me to be an option anymore. Because now you're in an argument at the bar and then eventually someone will say, hold on, I'll Google it. Yeah, well, and that, <laughs> that may give you reliable information or not, but many times it will, yeah, um, that's right. Uh, so. I mean, they had a lot of information as well, but not on a lot of stuff that I think we can be pretty confident about. Uh, I mean, I think uh, the, the atomic theory is not going to be overturned uh, anytime soon. So if we said something like, what is the goal of a human being? Am I right that sexist empiricists would say, the goal is to tranquility and how you get that is by suspending judgment. That's right. Well, I mean, he, he won't lay down the law and say that is the goal for human beings. Mm -hmm. uh, what he'll say is, because that would be a dogmatic statement in itself. Can you explain right. that? Why is there this contradiction with making a claim about suspending judgment? Well, if you're making a claim, then that's something you're not suspending judgment about. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, you know, it goes up another level, right? So. Um, saying that human beings, I mean, and, and maybe I should give it a little more of a context. I mean, um, in ancient Greek ethics in general, there's the idea of the goal of human life, um, or the goal or the aim, the telos is the Greek word. Um, and usually that's understood as what human beings should aim for, or what by nature human beings do aim for. Um, and I think Sextus is very careful to frame his view about what the goal is um, so as not to sound like that, okay? So what he says is, well, up to now, we skeptics uh, pursue this as the goal. So he's not saying this is the goal for human beings to, pers to pursue, he's saying this is what we pursue. And, you know, the implication is you might like to try it and maybe you'll find that it, um, uh, it's desirable too. Um, but yeah, he's not laying down the law about what the goal is for all of us. He's just saying, this is what we aim for. Is it not a claim itself to say, I'm going to suspend judgment? Um, no, it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a technique. I mean, the technique is a technique of suspending judgment. Mm. Um, I mean, it would be, uh, if he said something like, I guarantee you I'll never make any definite decisions in the rest for the rest of my life. Well, yeah, that would be a definite claim, but uh, he doesn't say that. What he says is, you know, this is what we do. Um, and yeah, and the phrase up to now or so far, that's quite a common um, sort of thing he slips in um, in his writings to make clear, you know, this is, all of this is just um, 
our experience as we found it for now and anything could be overturned so yeah for all as i said for all he knows he could discover the truth in the future but so far that's not how it works out uh, and so far tranquility is the result of suspending judgment now i mean I, I think actually he's more sure of that of the uh, tranquility is the effect he's more sure of that um than he should be uh, and and so that that idea suspension of judgment leads to tranquility um does sometimes come across in his writings as a dogmatic claim mm. uh, so uh, but uh, if you pressed him on it i'm sure he would say no no i'm just saying this is what we found so far but it doesn't always sound like that <laughs> uh, when he when he goes into great detail about you know how distressed all the non-skeptics are is the reason you took suspend judgment and turned it into keep an open mind is that with the purpose of avoiding the dogmatic irony that might come if you said anything else um well it, it's with the it, the the purpose was to get away from the idea that universal suspension of judgment is a realistic goal for us mm. as i said i don't think it is so it, i've changed it to keep an open mind because i think that's that's the part that we can still uh, you know value and learn from uh, in his example um so yeah that that that's why it's as i say it, what we can take from him and what he was aiming for are two somewhat different things uh, but there's enough in common i think to make it worthwhile uh, to read him and see how he does the job of uh, you know assembling all these opposing ideas and so on so let's say that i think you're right and i'm coming to you for guidance and i'm saying okay dr bet how should i keep an open mind do you have anything for me other than keep inquiring um well that that's the central idea and and and, and don't jump to conclusions too easily uh, and, and yeah, I mean, and that's, I mean, that, that, that's taken pretty directly from Sextus. Uh, he, he frequently accuses uh, his opponents of being rash. That, that is, they, they too easily uh, jump to conclusions and that's what you need to avoid. Um, so yeah, I mean, how you do that, the, the, there's a whole variety of ways I'm sure you could, um, but uh, yeah, that um, look at the alternatives. Yeah, don't jump to conclusions too quickly um always be aware that there might be more to be said on a given question those are you know they're pretty common sense sort of um pieces of advice but i think that's that's what you can take from this it sounds like something we could pass on to others we could teach each other and pass on to each other how to keep an open mind or the importance of keeping an open mind mm -hmm. that's great sure. yeah and i mean i think it's it, it's an important part of um scientific practice um well or, or you know uh, intellectual inquiry in general is uh not jumping conclusions too easily but uh it can apply it doesn't have to be like an academic activity it, it, it can apply in our uh, views about things in uh, everyday life as well is there any Final thoughts that you would like to share before we end on keeping an open mind or Sextus and Pyrrhus's work. Um, well, Sextus and Pyrrhus, most of his writings are directed against uh, other philosophers and, and, and uh, other theories. Um, but yeah, as I said, I mean, he, he thinks of it as uh, a recipe for tranquility. And so for him, yeah, skepticism is a way of life. Uh, it's not just uh, a set of abstract ideas, um, and so that's where that's why. And, and I mean, this was common in, in ancient Greek ethics: was your philosophy something you're supposed to be able to put into practice in real life? Um, and he's no exception uh, there. Uh, so, which is rather different from a lot of philosophers nowadays, uh, I think. Um, so, yeah, there's a real practical lesson um, for him, and yeah, as I've said. I think the lesson we can take from him is not quite the lesson he was actually promoting, but um, there's enough in common that his stuff is still worth reading. And yeah, and my book, you know, has some selections of the more accessible 
writings uh, of his, mostly from this book, Outlines of Pyrrhonism. 